In this session of Traffic School, you're going to be learning from my friend Don Crowther. Don, as far as I know, is right now the leading expert on using social media for internet marketing. Don's the creator of the Social Profit Formula, which is the, uh, the best training program online to teach you how to use the full range of social media to market your products and services. And the thing that I really like about Don is that uh, he's actually a real business guy. Okay, uh, He's worked in the, the business world um, in all types of different uh, executive jobs and so forth. Um, and here in your fancy bio, it says that uh, you've generated over $900 million in incremental profits uh, for big and small companies. Um, and I've had Don speak at a few of our events. Um, we've just had a tremendous response. People really love it when he talks because not only is he an expert on marketing and how to use social media, but he's also just someone that's fascinating to listen to and learn from. So thank you very much for being here, Don, and take it away. Well, thank you very much. All right. So what I would like to do today is to talk to you about how to get traffic to your websites using social media. And you need to understand a couple of things as we get going in this. The first one is that most people think that social media is all about the conversation. And so if you go and you look on Twitter or you look on Facebook, they're having these conversations about what they had for dinner last night and how they're not feeling very well and, and that they broke up with their girlfriend and things like that. Or they think it's about the relationship between them and the people that they are connecting with. And those two are very, very important elements. But it's important that we recognize that as we're trying to drive traffic through social media, if you were to make those two assumptions, you're wrong. Because, so, because if you're trying to actually make money using social media, there is something that is much, much more important than the conversation, and there's something that's much, much more important than the relationships. I like to think of it this way. I like to say there are two ways to do social media. One of them makes you money, and the other just gets you friends. But before I tell you about what it's really all about, I'd like us to consider something for just a moment. And that's this key question, which is, why are the search engines so fascinated by social media? What we have seen is that Google and MSN and Yahoo are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in social media right now. In fact, those three companies are, the in are basically the income for some sites like Twitter, Facebook, you know, sites you've probably never heard of before. And so these that's their primary source of income is that the search engines are coming in and basically buying this data from them they're buying our tweet stream they're buying our Facebook stream from them and the reason that they are doing that is not because it's all about the conversation and not because it's all about the relationship it's because social media is actually all about content and so content is the key to success in social media. If you want to do well in social media, one of the key things that you need to do is to learn how to master content. And then you'll master the Internet. Now, as I said at the beginning, relationships and the conversation are key elements of it. But the content is what the search engines are interested in buying. The content and the relationships between the content, in other words, the recommendations that come from that content, are what the search engines are interested in, in, in buying. And so what we need to be doing is we need to be giving them a consistent stream of content, not unimportant stuff but real live content that works for the search engines and it works for our particular audiences that we're trying to tra attract. I'd like to spend just a minute here and talk about a vital exercise that 
if you will actually sit down and do this, this exercise will take you between 10 and 30 minutes. It could take you two hours if you really go for it. And I actually suggest the longer and the more detailed you make this exercise, the better off you'll be. But here's the exercise, and this is, by the way, this is right out of Evan's book, okay? So this is the kind of thing that Evan teaches. I'm sure he's got worksheets that talk about this all over the place. So the first thing that I'd like you to do is to identify your target consumer. Who are you who are you really after? Who do you really want to have uh, be attracted? Who do you want as your followers on Twitter? Who do you want as your friends, your likes, your fans, whatever you want to call them on Facebook? Who do you want to have be following you on YouTube? Who do you want to be reading your stuff on the content sharing site? Who do you want to be reading your blog? Who do you want to have coming to your site? Identify that target consumer. Write down as much as you possibly can about them. Write down what what their interests are, what their age is, what you think their income is, whether they're male or female, what their side interests are that are separate from your particular separate from your particular uh, area of focus, but they're still something they're totally interested in because no one's one dimensional they're all interested in a number of different things and so write down all those elements about that target consumer so that you have flushed it out as much as possible and then what I like to actually do is I like to find a picture that represents that person for me and so it may be a picture of your Aunt Sue it may be a picture that you cut out of Cosmopolitan magazine it may be a picture of somebody who you know that fits these tra these these characteristics perfectly and then what I like to actually do is to tape a copy of that picture to the edge of my monitor so that anytime I'm trying to make a, de a decision I look up and I say what would and by the way I like to also give them a name and so it might be Billy Bob if my if that's descriptive that kind of name in my mind evokes the the person that's my target market then I've named it and I will look up and I'll say what would Billy Bob do what would Billy Bob want here at this particular point? And then that's what I give them. All right, next, so you've identified your target consumer. So take a piece of paper, take an Excel file, or take a Word file, and write everything that you can think about about that particular person. The next thing I want you to do is to identify your target consumer's information needs. And so what you're doing here is you're making a list of the kinds of things that they're interested in knowing about and so some of those things so obviously most of those things are going to revolve around your area of expertise but some of them will also involve related areas that go around the edge so other kinds of topics and interests that they may have so let me give you an example of this let's say your target market is uh, people who are interested in uh, in living a fit and healthy life okay so you will put down here's the kind of things that they're interested in living a fit and healthy life well peripherally to that they'll also potentially be interested in some things about exercise some things about diet some things about nutrition, some things about sleep habits, some things about maybe they need to lose some weight. And so all those areas go around the edge and are important areas for you to be considering giving them content about in your social media stream. And so you've got your main topic, and then you've got these peripheral topics that go around it. And so actually that one's probably not the best example because though all those are sort of interrelated. Let me step back and let's just say that you're, you're working with someone who your target market is triathlon uh, competitors. And so, uh, it, so your core would be how to compete in a triathlon. Uh, how to get in shape to compete in a triathlon. Well, what else would, would a triathlon person be interested in? Well, one of them is best bikes. Another one might be uh, travel arrangements to get to the different triathlons they compete in. Another one might be nutrition. Another one, and so you can go through and you start pulling things out of the out, out that you know that that person will also be interested in that are periphery to the core topic. And what I really want you to do is at the end product of this, I want you to come up with a list of 50 different key topics that your target audience wants to know about. And then your job is to go and deliver 
those needs. And so just to go back and, and reiterate this part about list of key 50 topics, what you're doing is you actually make a list that says here are topic areas and here are headlines that I can write about those different areas. And when you've done with 50, then I actually recommend you turn around and do another 50 and then do another 50. And so that in the end, you've got this wide list of topics so that you'll never again have writer's block. You'll never again be in a situation where you'll say, well, what am I going to talk about with these people today? And it's quite easy to do by the time you get your core topic as well as your periphery topics around it. And the key here is this becomes the list that you're going to write about. This becomes the list that you're going to post about. This becomes the core to everything that you do. And the interesting thing is, it also tells you what you can't post about. So, let's take the triathlon example, for example. You've decided that's the target audience. You've got all this list of 50 key topics. You'll look at that and you'll say, can I post about my feelings about politics. No, I can't. That's not on that list of, of, of needs. Can I post about my religious beliefs? No, that's not on that list. Can I post about the fact that I just broke up with my girlfriend? No, that's not on the list. And so it very quickly starts to identify not only what you should be posting about, but it tells you what you should not be posting about. Because the whole art of marketing is the art of attracting a target market and communicating with that target market in a way that they will want to buy pr the products and services that you offer. And so marketing is a process of making choices. The better choices you make, the better the results will be in the end. So that's your exercise. You're going to identify your target audience, you're going to identify what they're interested in, and you're going to write a list of 50 key topics that your target audience needs to know about. If you will do that, every single other presentation you're going to get in this entire two days will be improved by this process. Because what this does is it helps you identify, here's what I should be communicating to my target audience, which will help them considerably, and it will strengthen every single key strategy you're doing, whether it's webinars, whether it's emails, whether it's content, anything else. And this becomes the core of your social media communication, because remember, social media is all about content, with the relationships coming as an extra bonus from that content. So now, let me explain something that may blow you away. And that is this. It's the power of aggregation. So an aggregator is a person who gathers screens and communicates great content. So what you're listening to is aggregated content from Eben. What Eben has done is he and his team have gone out and they've identified the best people in these particular areas and they've gathered them all into one place so that you can come and sit down in one place and get all this great training in a two-day period or as it goes out later on, you'll get it in a, in a focused way. And so, Eben is an aggregator here. And the interesting thing that happens when you do this is that the people who aggregate get as much credit as the original producers of that content. Let me explain what I mean. So, if you are a person who consistently takes great content that's even produced by other people, and you gather it, you screen it, so you take out all the bad stuff, and you only communicate the good stuff, and then you communicate that to an audience, your audience comes to know you as the source of great information in this category. Now, you're not necessarily producing most of that content, but you are still now identified as the person they come to for information on this particular category. And unless you think that this is maybe not true, let me just point out that this aggregation model, you see it all over the place around you. So let me just think about this for just a minute. Who is Who do we know that aggregates well and frequently? So let's take your um, newspaper, for example. So, yes, newspapers aren't doing very well. They're starting to lose a lot, of, a, a lot of business. But what does a newspaper do? They've got a staff 
that produces about 5 to 10% of all the articles in that newspaper. The vast majority of, that, of the articles in that newspaper come from Associated Press, from Reuters, from different wire services that they gather that information in and just take it and cut and paste it into their newspaper. That's it. They're aggregating. That's what they're doing. And th- But the newspaper still gets the credit for giving you that information. The nightly news on TV does the same thing. They're gathering and aggregating that content for you. When you walk into a bookstore, you are walking into an aggregator. Here is a bookstore which takes pub, uh, information from thousands of publishers and combines it all into one place so that you can get that. And so whether you walk in physically into a Barnes & Noble or whether you go to Amazon, you end up working with an aggregator to get the information that you want. And so think about that as a social media model for a moment. Maybe what you should be doing is aggregating great content. And when you do that, what ends up happening is people begin to credit you with as much credit as the people who you're aggregating that content from. And so let me show you how you can turn this into something that where you can do the vast majority of your social media daily communications in 15 minutes or less. So let's start with Twitter. Why do we start with Twitter? Probably because Twitter is the fastest way to start getting profits using social media. It's not the best, but it's the fastest. And so here's what I'm going to suggest that you do. You start by identifying the top 100 to 500 to 1,000 blogs and sites in your target niche, the ones that are consistently creating a steady stream of information. Then you're going to post 10 to 15 tweets per day, each one of them being a headline and a link to one of the pages in those top 100 blogs or sites. And so in other words, you're not creating the vast majority of the information that you're tweeting about. You are sending them links to other people's content. And of course, your content should be included in those posts. And so if you've got a very active blog and you're doing a lot of things out there, your content should absolutely be included in those posts, but you don't have to produce everything that you communicate about. Most of the things that you communicate about are other people's information, and you are becoming the aggregator of that. This is an incredibly powerful technique that you can do literally in 15 minutes a day. If you use one of the tools that allows you to publish into the future, then you can sit down and in 15 minutes publish a whole day's worth of content and just let it go out there throughout the day. And then you check back a couple of times during the day and see if anyone's having a conversation with you about the content that you that you've sent out. And if they are, then you respond to that conversation and hold that conversation. But again, the content is the core, not the conversation. As you do this, what ends up happening is you get a net result of you tend to attract the audience that you want. Why? Because all these all these these blogs and these sites are all based on giving you the information that was on your list of 50 topics that we started this whole exercise with. And so you're giving your target audience the stuff they want to see. And the interesting thing is you're not doing anything other than what your target audience wants to see. And so other people who are outside of your target audience will look at your feed and say, I don't want to follow him. He keeps talking about triathlons. I'm not interested in triathlons. And so they don't follow you. And so that way, in the end, you only have triathlons long competitors on your particular on following your feed and those people then are ripe to sell stuff to and I'll talk more about that in a moment and so you attract the audience you want and you don't attract the audience that you don't want and let me just step back here and just make one point the posts that you make attract an audience and so if you are doing a haphazard approach to posting and having a bunch of different posts on a bunch of different subjects then what you're going to get is you're going to get a very non-targeted audience that is very varied that most of them don't care about what it is that you're trying to sell them. And so consequently, it becomes much like an email list. Frank Kern's famous for saying, I would rather have 500 people, 500 buyers on an email list than a list of 50,000 people that aren't interested in buying what I want to sell. And the same thing happens right here. You'd rather have just 
300 followers who are highly targeted than 30,000 followers, 27,700 of whom aren't interested in the least in what it is that you offer. And so you attract the audience that you want. Secondly, you train them to do what you tell them to. And so what you're telling them to do here is you're telling them, go click on this link. And as you send out a steady stream of information that, it, that ha contains links that tells them to go click on this link, and you don't have to tell them those words. You don't have to say, go click on this link. What you do is recognize that Twitter is the art of writing headlines. You've got 100 to 110 characters. I know you, you've got 140 characters, but you've got 100 to 110 characters. And just just hold it to that. That's all the that's the the absolute maximum length that you can go to. And then there's some characters for the URL, and then there's some characters to allow them to retweet you. That's the reason why you never want to go over 110 characters in what you actually write. So you've got 100 to 110 characters, and the only thing that you can write in that is a great headline. And so write great headlines. Learn how to write those. And then as you write them, then people are naturally going to click on that link that follows after that. And so you tr you get the audience you want, you train them to do what you tell them to, and then they come to know and trust you. And after a while, you are known as the expert in your category. And I believe if people do this strategy, as well as one other strategy I teach, within two to three months, they can be the absolute they can be considered one of the five top experts in any category in the world. Why? Because you're using aggregation and you're giving people what they want to hear. So, how do you make money from this? Wait a minute, Don. You're telling me I should post all my competitor stuff. When do I make money? Well, what, where you make money is that once every 100 to 200 posts post something promotional, post something self-serving. What happens then is that you have then earned the right to be able to sell them something. And what, what the problem is that most people set up an account, start sending promotional links out. So they set up an account. The first post they write is, hey, here's my site. Go buy something. Then they come back a few days later, a few hours later, and they say, have you bought something yet? And then it's, well, you haven't bought anything yet. Here's a coupon to go buy something. And then they say, oh, I'm getting desperate. Why haven't you bought anything from me yet? And then they write the whole social media off and saying that social media doesn't work. It's not the social media that doesn't work. It's what you did on the social media that didn't work. And so what you need to do is the vast majority of your posts need to be posts that give them great information, great content. And then once every 100 to 200 posts, when you've earned the right to sell, post something promotionally, only then do you try to sell them something. And realize, you never sell anything in social media. Social media introduces and builds credibility. It's your blog and your site that sell stuff. And so what your what your job is in social media is to get them off of the social media onto your blog and to your site so you can sell something to them there. And so that's the reason why you build this model where you're consistently giving them great links that they'll go to so that they will consistently learn to click on those links so that when you do something promotional, they'll click to it and they'll come to your site. All right, so there's your fa your Twitter strategy. You're going to go gather a bunch of blogs and sites that c give you a consistent c stream of information. You're going to post 10 to 15 tweets per day that aggregate that content, and then once every 100 to 200 posts, you post something self-serving. And you continue doing that in that ratio, and then people are more than willing to continue to allow you to give them great information because they know that they're only going to get sold to very occasionally. All right, so there's your Twitter strategy. Now, let's move on to Facebook for a moment. So, Facebook. Facebook, you're going to, fi you're going to uh, start by recognizing something, and that is this. Most people make a serious mistake on Facebook, and that is that they think that Facebook is about personal profiles. You need to recognize that Facebook teaches us and has a terms of, of use that does not allow you to sell anything in your personal profile. That's what pages are for. And so there's two types of Facebook uh, participations that you can do in terms of setting up
setting up your own page. You can set up groups and those kinds of things, yes. But separately from that, the things that you absolutely control, you can create a profile. Profiles are for people. You get one and only one of them. Pages are for companies. And you can have literally unlimited numbers of pages. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever tested the unlimited. I don't know if anyone's ever gone and tried to set up a million pages. Perhaps if they did that, Google, uh, Facebook may come back and say, sorry, you can't do this. But you certainly can do 10, 3, 40, whatever it is that works for you in terms of multiple Facebook pages. So your profile is where you have you and just your personal friends that you actually know in what we in the internet mark in the internet world call the meat world. So the meat world where it's you real life humans, not just avatars and words and memberships and those kinds of things so you 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 bring just your real friends into your profiles friends and family your pages is where you attract your customers and your prospective audience and so you want to build spend all your time focusing on your pages not your profile so the strategy that you do is you set up these pages and then you use the same strategy we just talked about where you take those hundred to 500 different blogs that are consistently giving you information and you choose three to six of those posts per day and you post them to your Facebook page. And so that your Facebook audience is consistently getting a set of good, high quality links from you every day. And there's something else you need to recognize about Facebook and that is you are never farther from than one post away from never being seen again on Facebook. Now, I, I need you to recognize this, and I need you to understand what I just said. You are never more than one post away from being permanently never seen again on Facebook. Here's the way it works. Let's say you send out a blatant pitch message on your Facebook page or your Facebook profile, either one, your audience sees that and says, I don't want to see this stuff. And so all they have to do is hover their mouse over that post and a little X pops up in the corner or a remove pops up in the corner, depending on whether they're working on pages or profiles. But if they click that X in the corner, another message will pop up and it says, do you really, do you really want to remove Don Crowther so you won't see any more of his messages? If they say yes, they will never again see any of your messages. So if you think that you've got 5,000 uh, people who have liked you on Facebook, you probably have some significantly smaller number of people that are actually seeing your messages because they've removed themselves, but they've never unfriended you. So recognize that process. And so on Facebook, you're not going to do 100, every 100 to 200 uh, posts you've earned the right to send something promotional. What you do is on Facebook, you never actually send out a purely promotional message. What you do is you send them a message that takes them into your site, which be, then becomes a purely promotional message. So you never take the risk of being blatantly promotional on Facebook. Because as I said, you're only one post away from never being seen again. So recognize you got to be more careful on Facebook if you want to succeed. But you can still build huge audiences on Facebook as well as Twitter. And those audiences can be just eating out of your hand and doing everything you tell them to do. Just don't blow it by becoming overly promotional. That's not what people are on Facebook for. Now I will give you one small exception and that is they tend to like Facebook people tend to like coupons so if you can give them a coupon you can be a little more blatant with those but I don't suggest you go out and just create a coupon feed so for, so for example there is a, a bakery in my town who has a Facebook page and their Facebook page posts are here's our pastry of the day here's our coupon of the day and that's all it is now they do have a few people who are high fans of that particular of that particular bakery who are then following that and running in every time to get the pastry of the day but the vast majority of people in the town have long ago buried them 
and aren't even paying attention to them anymore because they never get anything but hey come buy this stuff from me so Twitter and Facebook now contrary to popular belief Twitter and Facebook are not social media they are just a very very small portion of social media I crack 1680 different social media sites and the vast majority of them are not doing what Twitter and Facebook are doing they're getting huge amounts of success in a number of different ways and so I'm going to now move off of those two things that you consider to be the foundation of social media and I'm going to move into a couple more strategies that I hope will help you that will are actually where some of the real money in social media is being made. I said that Twitter is the fastest money. Now I'm going to show you where the best money is being made in social media. And the first place I'm going to talk about is your blog. Yes, you're boring. Let's go back five years ago and start talking about blogs again. But trust me, blogs are the core of any successful social media strategy. It's where you send people from your Twitter and Facebook. It's where you participate and have conversations with people it's where you do all kinds of stuff that you could not have done in any place else it is an incredibly powerful tool and on top of it search engines love blogs so here's your strategies to be able to succeed using blogs as social media tools the first one is remember those 50 topics that we did back in the first in the first section of this course well that's what you're going to blog about. You're going to take those 50 topics, ideally even if you've got 50 headlines, and you're going to post those 50 headlines. That's what you're doing. And just drop down through that. And by the way, by the time you get to about 40, sit down and do another 50. Go do some keyword research. Take things off the top of your mind. Go look at your competitors. See what they're writing about. See other topics so that you never have the point where you sit down on your computer and say, what am I going to write about today? Because you do that three or four days, you stop blogging. So you always want to have a rich thing that you can throw a dartboard at and write about whatever that dart hits or look at and say, ooh, that sounds exciting today. All right, so then you take and you promote your blog post through your Twitter and Facebook and all the other tools that are out there. And then each post that you have on your blog pushes something. You should never write a blog post without an uh, ulterior, ulterior motive. So that ulterior motive, in most cases, is building trust, building your expertise, but it also should have, uh, hey, opt in, hey, buy this, whatever it is. But that's not the purpose. It's the ulterior moment, motive. So the vast majority, if you've got a thousand word long blog post, the last 40 words sell them on whatever it is that you want to sell them on. The vast majority of before that is pure great content. So here's a couple more blogging techniques. The first one is what I call seminal blog posts. So these are the blog posts. They tend to be longer. They can't tend to be carefully reasoned. They tend to get great comments. So these are the posts where you sit back and you say, you know what? Something needs to be said in our category. And I am going to teach people how to do that. So I just did one of these just yesterday, as a matter of fact. I did a, I did a thing that I mailed out to my list about uh, pictures in blog posts. And I pointed out to them that you can't just go to Google Images anytime you need a picture and slap it up on your page. If you do, you're likely to get lawsuits, bills from Getty Images for $2,500, which you have to pay, by the way, or they, th or they sue you, or whatever. You can't, just because a picture is out there, doesn't mean that it's legal for you to use. And so what you need to do is you need to have other ways of getting to that information. And so on my DonCrowther.com blog, I put up an article about how to get free images, free pictures for your blog. And sent it out to my list, did an interesting little test last night uh, of headlines and ways of making the offer. And it's, that's another result I'll give you at some point in the future. But it's really, really interesting that uh, that was a seminal blog post. It was long. It was probably, I don't know, 1,500 words. Plus, I put a video in there that showed people how to do that. That's a seminal blog post. Other examples of seminal blog posts. Um, Here's the 100 best tips in this particular marketplace. 100 best ways to blank. That tends to be a seminal blog post. Here are the 50 best bloggers in this particular marketplace. That's a seminal blog post. Um, here are the impacts of X on our industry. 
So a new law that's just passed. Here's the impacts of that on our industry. Um, that can be one. Or the recession on it. Or uh, increase in gas prices. What's the impact on that? And so all these things, and, and, and in many cases, a seminal blog post is you expressing a reasoned opinion about what's going on. Why do you do these? Because lots of people link to them. Lots of people, these are the kinds of blog posts that are still going to be getting traffic three years from now, assuming it's an evergreen kind of topic. And so go ahead and don't be afraid to do those. All right, some other blogging, blogging techniques. Controversy. What I mean when I say controversy is, is where you're calling it like it is. You're going against the grain and you're saying what everyone else is really thinking. One of my most successful blog posts that I ever wrote was one, uh, there had just been a new ad come out from, by, uh, from Hardee's and I can't remember what Hardee's is called in other parts of the United States. It's, it's two chains. And it had Paris Hilton washing a Bentley. And it, she, she's, it, it's soft porn. Uh, and the television stations won't let them run it after se before seven o'clock in the evening. And you know she's squeezing this sponge with soapy water pouring down her bikini and, and all that kind of stuff. And that was a, a regular commercial that ran on national TV. The problem was, Hardee's did it, and they paid her a ton of money to do it. Hardee's did it because they were trying to shift their audience from moms with kids to hungry teenagers. The problem was it didn't work. And I actually, and I pulled Hardy's data and I showed that their sales actually went down as a result of running this ad. And I said, the marketer, the ad agency, and the president of this company should be fired for taking this risk because they made a bad decision that's bad for stockholders. They should be fired. And I went through and I called it like it was. I showed the facts. And I showed what, and yes, there was all kinds of talk. There was, because, hey, the ad, agency, ad agencies would love to be able to run soft porn on TV consistently because that wins them awards. It gets a lot of attention. It gets a lot of people talking about it, but it doesn't sell stuff. And so consequently, I said what everyone else was thinking, and I got a ton of links. I got a ton of traffic to that particular blog post, and it was a really good example of saying calling it like it is, pointing out something that is different than what the rest of the world is saying, but saying it in a well-reasoned way, going against the grain. All right, so that's blogging. Go and work on your blog. If you have 100 articles and you're saying, where should I post those? Well, I would suggest you post at least 30 of them to your blog. And then you can go do to other article sites out there. And article sites are a huge piece of the content sharing strategy. But uh, the core is you've got to build your blog. All right, now let's talk about another piece of social media that is very, very key, and that is video. I am absolutely convinced that video is the most underutilized and potentially most powerful tool that most companies can use. But most companies aren't doing anything about it because they say, it's too hard, it's too expensive. And a lot of you, I bet you, have had that very thought. And trust me, video is neither hard nor expensive if you do it right. So I'm going to show you in a moment several ways to do video that are incredibly powerful. But first off, I just want to give you the foundation of what happens with video. Today, a quarter of all the web's bandwidth is video. But Cisco predicts that that figure will rise to 90% of all the web bandwidth will be video within three years, two and a half years from now. What's that saying? Video is huge and it is exploding. Last year, video grew 62%. By 2020, it will be nearly 50 times what it was last year. People are watching video. Are you there with your videos? That's enough to fill 75 billion iPads all the way to the limit. It's the digital equivalent of the entire population of the Earth tweeting continuously for a century. That's what's coming in video. You need to be there and you need to be actively participating. So let me show you some ways that you can do video and some ideas that I just want to point out to you that you ought to be considering as you work on video. The first one is video reviews. People love reviews. And so 
let's just imagine for a moment that you ran run a site that has uh, that where you're making your money selling stuff. Okay, it's an e-commerce store, for example. Or let's just imagine a second model, which is you make your money with selling ad clicks to people who come to a site. Both of those strategies are excellent for video reviews. And so you ought to be up with reviewing the latest, greatest, plus all the other things that aren't late and great in your particular category. And do a video review where you talk about that particular item, in this case the iPhone, and you talk about the strengths, the weaknesses, the things that you've seen that are valuable, and it's best if in the end you can give a, I give this one a thumbs up, thumbs down, I give this an ABCD rate, I give this a score of 68 on a score of 1 to 100, whatever it is, give great information, review these things. Now people say, well how can I review things? I can't afford to buy the things to be able to review and the manufacturers won't send them to me. Well there's a very, very easy way to do this, go on Amazon, buy it, bring it in, take all your pictures, take your video, review it, and then put that review up and turn around on eBay and sell it for 95% of what you bought it for three days later. It's a great way to, to build this consistent set of reviews without ever actually having to fork out a lot of money. Because you don't necessarily have to keep everything you review. Go ahead and sell it. Alright, next is top X lists using video. So, the top five best gifts for teens for the holidays. The five best honeymoon locations. The six best uh, phones for you to buy. The I can go on and on. So take your category and find out Oh, the 43 best blogs in this marketplace. Now, you probably wouldn't do that on a video. You probably do would be the top five, and then the next five, and then the next five. So break them up into shorter videos. You don't want to have two hour long videos in most cases. But you can build huge amounts of equity, huge amounts of links, huge amounts of viewers, and huge amounts of fans by doing top X lists. And they're some of the easiest things out there to do. Next is a video blog where you just jump in every day and you blog something on video. Uh, a good friend of mine had for a number of years had a couch so they he had he had a real company with real employees he had a couch with a camera mounted permanently on that couch every day at 3 p.m. that camera would turn on and run for I don't know what it was two minutes let's just say and it would run and it would automatically post and then it would turn off and he had done some programming he was a bit of a programmer and it would turn off and immediately post that to their blog and so every day at three o'clock it was a job of somebody in the company to go sit on that couch and say something interesting now you don't have to get quite that though that is a good idea you don't have to get quite that rigorous of this process but if you were to send out something every day that talked or maybe twice a week maybe three times a week whatever it is send out some regular videos that give people information that can be an incredibly powerful way to build a long-term audience for your for your blog uh, and uh, get great advertiser traffic by the way too which is a great source of incremental uh, revenue alright next is a daily video and what I mean when I say that I, I separate that from a video blog and when I say that uh, the, a daily video what I really mean here is where you're doing a set of videos you don't have to film them every day you can sit down and film on one day the next 21 days worth of video and just walk into a studio and I'm sure Eben has, has had this kind of thing before where his staff is put together here's these scripts he walks into the studio he reads this one then they end that one he reads the next one they end that one then he reads the next one 
in that one and now we've got this bank of videos that you can then send out that can be an incredibly powerful way again to build your audience now let's talk about how you do that the first one is screencast video you are watching a screencast video right now you just saw that thing move in from the upper right hand corner you can do this very very easily very inexpensively and by the way it's great because you don't have to worry about editing you don't have to worry about lighting all you have to do is buy a program like Camtasia which is available from techsmith.com they have a version for PC they have a version for Mac uh, the Mac version is $99 the PC version I believe is $199 or $299 I can't remember but it, it's more expensive and then on the Mac they all there's another one called ScreenFlow uh, there is a free one called Jing but Jing's got a lot if you're gonna do this seriously you're going to want to buy one of these programs uh, there are a number of other programs out there that do this uh, Microsoft Expression Engine does this but you you basically are recording what happens on the screen and so the easiest way to do this is to do exactly what you're seeing here I have created a PowerPoint video a PowerPoint, I'm sorry, I've created a PowerPoint and all I'm doing is talking while I'm clicking through that video. And by the way, uh, Microsoft 2010, the Microsoft Office 2010, the PowerPoint actually now has the ability to do all this recording. So you don't even have to buy that. And I, actually, I believe the Keynote does that too. And so you don't even have to buy this extra software. All you need to do is turn it on and record and talk to it. That way, if you've got a face made for radio, no one ever has to see your face. Now, it's not the ideal, but it certainly works, and it certainly works well. Here's some other video strategies. Buy.com has some great ways of doing this through guest videos, where you invite people to come in who are experts on a particular topic, and you interview them about that particular topic. Uh, so, for example, this person over here on the right, I uh, one day was was uh, eating lunch at a big internet convention, and uh, there were, the table was half full or so, and we were all talking, and and then she came and sat down on the table, and I look at her and I go, I know you from someplace, and I I where did you grow up? Where did you go to college? And I kept going, no, 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 and then all of a sudden I realized she's the buy dot com girl. And please don't take that wrong. When I say girl, woman, she's the person on buy.com that does all these videos, all these interviews with people. And I knew her, and to me, she was as much of a celebrity, and she was trustworthy because I'd seen her several dozen times doing these interviews. And the interesting thing is, she all she does is ask great questions. It's the person who's sitting beside her. It's this person right here who's probably selling a hard drive or whatever, and she's probably from the company. She's the one who's got all the expertise, but this person is the one that I trust. Why? Because she's aggregating. She's bringing in these great people to give lots of great information. And so one of the things that you should consider doing is, is go to conventions and find experts and sit down with them and, and film them or have them come to your office or you go to their office or you do it over the phone, whatever it is. Get guest videos where you're getting real live experts to film things with you that you can then put up. Another te technique, and this is sort of everything prior to this, is free line video. Now, Evans taught us that a lot, is give info away. Give your best stuff away so that then people will say, wow, if this is what I can get for free, what else, what's this guy going to give me when I buy something from him? All right, so consider taking your video and putting it up for free all over the place and by the way I'm going to show you in a moment a place where there are three incredible free line videos that I'd like to invite you to go and look at alright video technique you need to recognize the first 10 seconds of the video is key one of the key mistakes I, I was watching a video the other day and this guy spent 45 seconds with this music and pictures of him and things flipping around in the background and more pictures of him and I'm going why is this guy so stuck on himself? He spent 45 seconds showing me pictures of himself. And then he ended with another 30 seconds of showing me more pictures about himself. And if I, if, if I wasn't watching that to examine his video technique, I would have kicked off long before. But I didn't. 
I wanted to see what he was doing and came to realize how what an incredibly bad job he was doing in this concept. And the first 10 seconds is the key. That's when you will lose 80% of the people who you are going to lose in watching any video are going to be gone in the first 10, 8 to 10 seconds. And so start by saying something really interesting or showing them something really interesting or promising them that you're going to show them something interesting in the body of it. And so you may want to come on and say, hi, this is Don Crowther. In the next two minutes, I'm going to teach you about this, this, and this, and then start teaching them. As you've done that, what you've just done is you just tell them, hey, these are the reasons you want to stay because you're going to learn this in the next two minutes. Number one, it tells them this is going to be over in two minutes, so they know they can count on that. And the second thing is, now they know what they should be looking for, and they'll start watching for it. So it's incredibly t uh, powerful. So you start by enthusiastically telling them what you're going to give them in this video. Next, each video should end with a free offer call to action. So there should be something they can get for free that then goes off and, and gives them some kind of call for action. Maybe it's a sign up for our mailing list. Maybe it's a, uh, do this to get 50 more free videos. So I just actually recorded one of these uh, yesterday. Uh, so if so, I... I had it at the end of my video, I had it go to static, like TV static, for half a second, and then I come on and say, Hi, it's Don again. If you would like to get more free tips just like this, go to doncrowther.com and sign up for our mailing list there. Now, that's doncrowther.com. Just go do this stuff. And so I ended, so that was what I, what I recorded. It was about eight seconds worth of video, and that's what I tagged onto the end of another video just before I put it up on YouTube. And so that's a powerful piece that I recommend that you do and add to the ends of your videos. So where do you promote your videos once you've got these things created? You're going to promote them. Tube Mogul is a great free service. They've got some paid services in there too, but it's great free services which will allow you to quickly post them to a number of different sites. Traffic Geyser is a paid service uh, that, that will send them out to even more sites. You obviously definitely want to put them on, up on YouTube. Uh, Twitter, you should promote them there. And Facebook, you should not only promote them, but put them on your Facebook uh, site also. And you should clearly embed them in your blog posts. I'm going to end by giving you one more key technique here. And this is a very important technique. And here's what it is. It's called the you don't have to technique. This goes to something that I consistently have people come and say to me. They say, oh, I can't follow that many people on, face, on, on Twitter because I can't read everything they post. Or I can't... I, I'm not interested in doing this internet marketing stuff because I can't read. I already get too many emails every day as it is. You need to realize that you don't have to read every tweet that anyone posts, every email that you receive, every post in your RSS feed, every blog post that your key target audience writes. Recognize that it's your life, it's your business, you make the rules. And one of those rules is, I don't read everything everyone else writes. One of the key things that I find when I go out there and I look at the people who, are, uh, who have audiences of 10,000 or more on, on Twitter, is that almost none of them ever reads anything that their audience posts. They are posting their own concepts out. Every once in a while they'll retweet something, but most of them have some kind of list of people that they're following. And you'll see that all their retweets come from the same people. Why? Because they have a list, that, and that's the only thing they're reading. Everyone else, they are ignoring. So as soon as you do that, as soon as you realize that you don't have to do this guilt thing, where you don't have to feel like you have to respond to somebody just because they retweeted you. You don't have to do something just because somebody does something that affects you in some way. You make your choices. Now, sometimes those choices have bad consequences. You need to rec understand that. But you make your choices, and in the end, it will help you considerably. I'm going to give one special offer. So if you will go to, I told you a moment ago about uh, some free line content. So if you go to www.socialprofitformula.com and opt in there, there are three free traffic building social strategy videos that are really good. 
One of them is a video strategy that goes way beyond what we talked about here. One of them explains this concept of uh, what the uh, you can either make money or you can have lots of friends on fa on on social media. There's a huge difference between the two of them. And then the third one goes you goes through the whole landscape of social media and shows you all the different places in there and shows you a bunch of different techniques that you can use to succeed in many of those different areas. So most of those well, I didn't even have time to discuss in this particular webinar. But that video is very very powerful. It's called the social media landscape and and it's a must watch for everyone here. So socialprofitformula.com opt in there and you'll be able to do that. And Evan, I am ready to take some questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Don. Um, you can hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, fantastic. I had myself on mute there. That's great. I took a, I took a ton of notes, Don, um, which, uh, I don't know, I guess that's my ultimate compliment when you can't see me, huh? Yeah, cool. <laughs> hey, it's better than you sleeping, you know. <laughs> so, um, okay, great. A question from Shirley. Uh, what if you are in multiple niches? So, for example, uh, direct sales coach, a small business hiring and team building coach, online marketing for offline business, and affiliate marketing of products. So, four niches. How do you manage your social media communication strategy? Would you create different profiles on Twitter and tweet per different audience and niche? Thank you. Okay, surely. Thank you. That is a great question. Here is the key. Recognize when I, when I started off and I talked about identifying your audience and then building a steady stream of content targeted at that audience, that's exactly what you do. You have a Twitter, uh, a Twitter account that you only talk about your sales coach things. And then you have a separate Twitter account where you talk about your small business coach things. You have a separate account that's for your internet marketing. So because you want each one of those audiences to be targeted, and if, if, the, if you're talking about sales coaching with the internet marketing people, they're going, why does this person keep saying these things about sales coaching? I'm not interested in that. They end up unfollowing you, even though the next tweet that you would be sending out would be an incredibly powerful one for them. So you separate your audiences. Now, Twitter says it is against their TOS for you to have multiple accounts if you use them purely for the purpose of gaming the system and getting more followers. It is totally acceptable for them for you to have multiple Twitter accounts for multiple different audiences. That is acceptable. It is encouraged, as a matter of fact. Now, I will bring up one thing. Every time you set one of these up, you're going to have to do some work to continue to populate it and continue to give information. So if you have something where you think you might be able to group people together, I'd suggest you group of people together. Uh, but if you have different audiences, you will want to have different social media presences for each one of those audiences. Excellent. Uh, question from Rick. Should blog posts be dated? And what about the idea of evergreen content or creating separate pages on your blog? I suggest that most blog posts be undated. And most blog posts, you try to work as hard as you can to make them evergreen. Why? Because, okay, for example, I wrote, I wrote a post uh, about um, the, uh, viewing the Olympics on social media. And another one about uh, Olympic apps, iPhone apps for for the Olympics, and that was great for two weeks, and now they're totally useless. And so, if I could have taken that exact same time and done something about something that was more evergreen, now I don't regret that I spent that time. That's fine, but the more evergreen content that you can do, the better off you can do. So, actually, let me tell you. Uh, uh, dirty little secret here actually dirty is the wrong word I sent out a mailing to to my email list yesterday about a blog post that I wrote back in May got thousands and thousands of people who came to that blog post yesterday and watched and, and, and read it but the post was one that I actually wrote back in May and so that's the advantages of evergreen content is that it truly is be evergreen and you can turn around and reuse it later on in different ways so I suggest taking the dates off and just posting things 
when you get new stuff. It's great. And uh, just to clarify, when, when Don says evergreen, the idea is to not include information in your content that would date it or would make it seem old at a future time. Just want to re you just want to restate that, yeah. Here's a question from uh, Jeffrey. In the 100 to 200 tweets before you do a promotion, is it okay to include links to your own content as long as it's not a selling message? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you remember from that from that one slide, I said some of these would be your own content. And so, absolutely, just, just don't sell. Uh, so your content should be included in those posts. So put links to your blog posts, et cetera. Just don't put selling messages. Great. A uh, question from David. With videos, should we put them on YouTube and then just connect to your blog, Facebook, to YouTube? Or are we losing value by not hosting these vi videos on your blog directly instead? All right. So you just entered a huge set of, of issues. Um, here's what I suggest. I suggest that you have some content that you only host yourself, that is only available on your site. Uh, and then you have a bunch of other content that's out on the public sites. Now realize that you lose, there, there's disadvantages and advantages for each one of those things. And so if you got it out on YouTube, you're going to have many people who are going to find you on YouTube. As a matter of fact, yesterday I put a video up on YouTube, and as I said, I mailed about this. And But before I even mailed, I w I'd gotten like three, 276 video uh, views of that of that YouTube video before I even mailed about it and so YouTube was sending traffic to that video all by itself then I send a whole bunch more through mailing on it and having people watch it separately and so there's real value in that but there's also value in having something out on let's say s3 Amazon s3 which is a great way to uh, video out there without you having to pay for well you'll have to pay for the bandwidth but you, it's not part of your regular hosting account it lives out s someplace else and there's a, a site called EZ so the letter E the letter Z the letter S and then three EZS3 uh, which is a tool which allows makes it easy to be able to go out and grab put videos out on Amazon S3 bring them in and show them on your site uh, so I would suggest you do s some of each is basically what I would suggest and uh, that way you've got stuff that people have to be coming to your site if they want to see because you do want to be absolutely driving people to your site and there's some messages that you can't put on YouTube uh, blatant sales commercials you can't put on YouTube uh, and so just drive people to your own to your own stuff but also recognize the advertising value of having them out on the big networks. Question from JB. What's the best design strategy for landing pages for selling offers sent out via Twitter and Facebook? How much is needed to convert the conversation from information gathering to relating to buying? Okay. Is he talking about squeeze pages here or is he talking about other like blog posts? You know what? I, I actually can't tell. Will you talk to both ideas of sending directly to a marketing page or a squeeze okay. page? Okay, all right. So squeeze pages, you've seen a lot of squeeze pages. Let's define what a squeeze page is. A squeeze page is a page where uh, the primary purpose of that page is to get you to opt in, to put your email address into a form, which then puts you on the mailing list of the person who's sending that out. So you see this in the Internet marketing world constantly. Uh, and uh, and there's some real reasons, some real strategic reasons for that, and you want to build your list. And so uh, the best practices are, are, are all over the place out there. They tend to be a video with you talking about the advantages of them opting in by clicking right over there. And oftentimes it's even best if you say, click on that button that's right over there, and you point to it or whatever. Uh, and so they should contain some text and we've seen a bunch of different ways of doing it with some text some video uh, and you will want to test it with your particular audience and by the way we saw during my launch of social profit formula a huge difference uh, just with some very very small changes so so absolutely you should test on those pages so unfortunately the problem with squeeze pages is that Google hates them 
and so they'll never do well in the social in the search engines if you especially if you make your home page for a site be a squeeze page so the best the best thing that I recommend there is a squeeze page is primarily your focus is on getting them to opt in so you give them enough information enough enthusiasm in your video and text so that they will want to do that that's your primary purpose there so let's say a, a great example of this is uh, if you have you, the end of your video says for 30 more tips like this go to this page and then that page is a squeeze page and then you have a video that says hey we've got this there's 30 tips they're including things like this 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 just put your email in that in that box right over there and you'll have instant access to all of them okay that's a that's a, the balance of information now in a in a blog post or a web page uh, in most cases what you're trying to do is you're doing about 90 to 95 percent information followed by a sales message at the end and so that's where your rate ratio goes it's about 90 10 sometimes 70 30 but as soon but what I find is anytime people drop into sales mode people go away and I we all see it as we who do webinars that are sales webinars you might have 374 uh, people on the line and then the minute you start doing a sales pitch it drops to 300 because the people know the information's over now it's time for the sales pitch and so they go away so recognize that as you write these things that people are going to start abandoning you so take them as far down the content give them the information you want them to know so you build the trust then they're more likely to respond to your sales message so a question from Dave hi Don what's the best way of monetizing content in your experience putting it on a blog with AdSense, hub pages, or Squidoo? The best way to monetize, the best way is to have a blog that's generating significant amounts of traffic and then you are monetizing with AdSense, you're selling advertising. So the very, very best monetization in the world is a ton of traffic coming to your own blog that you are then selling advertising directly to the advertisers on that blog that's the most profitable way in the end of doing it but there are several prerequisites to be able to pull that off number one you have to have a blog that gets a ton of traffic most blogs don't qualify number two you usually have to you have to have advertisers who actually want to advertise on your blog and so if your blog is a generic blog you're not going to get those advertisers if your blog is incredibly highly targeted at um, the triathlon market then you'll be able to go to the triathlon bike maker and be able to get them to advertise on your on your blog uh, but if it's more about personal health it's gonna be a lot harder finding those people to do it uh, maybe personal health is a bad example because you can do that but if it's about uh, home home having a better home you're gonna have trouble finding specific advertisers to come in and then the third thing is you need to have some kind of ad sales process and ideally an ad sales force which is oftentimes one guy whose job it is to call all these manufacturers and say hey here's our ads and those kinds of things that's the best now stepping back if you don't have those if you don't have the blog with tons and tons like hundreds of thousands of visitors per month to be able to make any serious money then AdSense is really good on your blog uh, putting up affiliate offers is really good on your blog. Uh, putting concept uh, things on hub pages, it can be incredibly powerful. Hub pages pays you 60% of all the revenues that get made for in, in ads comes to you. And oftentimes, especially if you have a, bl a blog that's getting somewhat low traffic, you can make more money putting that same article on, a hu on hub pages than you can on your own blog. Uh, Squidoo, the it's not quite as good in terms of ad payouts because Squidoo has certain things they can assign to your specific blog but like for example the AdSense and those kinds of things they can't tell which page got actually that click and so then they take it and break up those revenues across everyone based upon a formula that primarily has to do with popularity of your particular site pages on excuse me lenses on Squidoo and so uh, I put them in that order your blog first Hub pages second, unless you've got a low, a low uh, traffic log, and then start putting. Then hub pages may take the place of uh, your blog in terms of making money. Question from Elaine. Hello, Don. I'm still not clear on the distinction or difference between video blogs and daily videos. Can you elaborate? 
Okay, a video blog, and, and, and that's a great question. It's a little hard to explain the difference, and very frankly, it's sort of in the eye of the beholder. A video blog tends to be a little bit more of, here's my impression, here's, here's, it, it becomes more of an editorial statement. Daily videos can be just videos, of, so here's step one to, how, here's knitting, how to choose your yarn. Step two, the next day, how to choose your needles. Step three, how to cast on. And you go through that process. And so that could be a series of daily videos where you're doing a two to five minute video each day explaining a process of going through knitting a sweater, for example. Uh, a daily blog tends to be, oftentimes, tends to be more opinion based. These, those aren't usually as successful because not everyone cares about your opinion. And so unless you've got something where you've generated a following. So, for example, there's a guy named Chris Perillo in the Internet space who has, he's very opinionated about a lot of things. And he has uh, uh, an amazing personality that a lot of people like and a lot of people hate. Uh, and so, consequently, he's generated a very large audience who dearly loves him, and he's generated another audience that doesn't like him much. And so recognize that personalities are polarizing. And so just... I I would focus more on daily video if I were you in today's particular market. From Alex, any tool you recommend for posting an article to multiple sites? Don't do it. That's my statement. <laughs> uh that's that's creating duplicate content. You don't want to create duplicate content. It's not it's not a very good idea. And so I do not recommend posting a single article to multiple sites ever. So I won't recommend a tool. Great. So a uh, question from Michael. Can you talk about how your personal blog relates to your landing pages or behind the opt-in blog? So related is different domains and cross-linking between them. It's, it's really tough to run a successful behind an opt-in blog. The vast majority of your blogs should be outside. If you really want a behind an opt-in blog, set up a membership site and do it there and get some people to pay you. Uh, but what I would do is I would keep, keep things outside and primarily do things in a public blogging kind of situation and then drive some people into a membership site where they're paying you to be able to get that incremental information. It's really long term. There's not very many success stories of behind opt-in blogs being highly successful over time. Just look at the at the at the war that's being constantly played out in the media spaces with newspapers trying to have uh pay-per-view uh, articles. Those are behind opt-in blogs. And it, it just doesn't work very well. But to specifically answer your question, I would sp send most of my links to my public blog, have a few blo links that go in internal, but realize the search engines can't even see them because they're behind an opt-in. So the, that link does no good whatsoever for you. So you may want to link onto your squeeze page that gets that creates the opt-in but I won't link to the articles behind it because the search engines aren't even able to get to that unless you allow them to do so and as soon as they do that they index the information it doesn't do any good anyway so I I, I guess overall I'd step back and say are you sure you've got a good strategy here in the first place all right that's my answer and I'll stick to it okay <laughs> <laughs> so from uh, Eddie how long in advance do you have to start to use social media to launch a movie? Would you recommend to do it oneself or to hire an expert? If you're one, if you're launching a movie and the future of that movie, because remember, you've only got one day in moviedom to succeed, I would definitely start four to six months in advance, and I would not do it myself. There are people out there who are experts in that, and movies are hundreds of millions of dollars in potential, and so don't don't rely upon yourself to do that. Uh, another question here. What are the keys of making social media viral? Write great content. That's the number one key. The number two one is to have friends that have large followings that are, that are interested in what you're posting about so that they will post it to their audiences. That's the core. When you look at viral and st actually study viral, you'll see that the, that the vast majority of, of viral came from 
having a certain very, very small, very connected group who pride themselves on putting things out and making things go viral. Uh, they, they're the group that creates the viral. So there are some great things that have come out that have never gone viral because those guys didn't get excited about it. And so you've got to find those that group of people. How do you find that? Well, hang out, go go pay attention and dig. Uh, there's some interesting things. Unfortunately, dig is starting to shoot itself in the foot with a bazooka these days. Uh, but go go find the leaders in your category and get them on your site. If you've got them and they're willing to post about it, they're willing to email about it, then you'll that's the secret to go viral. But you have to create great content in the beginning. Here's a question from Danielle. I have a Facebook page for my company as well as my personal pro profile. I'm finding that people are connecting to me via my profile instead of my page. How can I get people to connect with my company page instead of my individual profile? Okay, so you send them and so you don't accept them as friends. You click on the thing to send them a message and that message says, hi, this is Danielle. Uh, I really appreciate you wanting to friend me. However, my personal profile is limited to just my personal family and friends. I invite you, however, to f to like my business page. And here's the email and here's the address for that, where I'll be ha more than happy to have you be one of my fans there. And then you send that to them, and then you click the ignore in your friend friend feed. Great question from Anthony. Uh, great advice. I had a question about your recommendation for blog posting. Does it hurt your Google blog ranking if Google sees uh, you have loads of links in your blog posts all going to a separate opt-in sales site where you're selling your product? My understanding of Google's ranking system is that they are looking for pure content blogs on subjects and are penalizing content blogs who appear to have an ulterior agenda. I like that word, ulterior. Okay, ulterior. Okay, first off, I recommend that your blog be on your site. So your your blog should be at www.yoursite.com slash blog. That's where your blog is living. If you are having an external blog where all the links point to a given site, you're absolutely right. Google, Google will penalize you for that. That's not the way you want to have it. So take your blog and put it on your site. Then Google understands exactly what you're doing because you're linking into your own site from your own blog. They do not penalize those. A uh, question from Silvio. Uh, how do you use uh, social media the right way when you're launching a product? Okay. The core to that question comes down to whether you're doing a product launch that's only going to be open for a short period of time or whether you're doing a permanent launch. There's, slight, there's differences in the strategy that work in terms of that. Uh, if you were launching a product and it's only going to be open for a short period of time, what you want to be doing is incentivizing the process of people passing on links into that during that period of short time. Uh, and so that's where your core is. So you're trying to get, you're trying to make it so that people see see you everywhere. And so that's where you focus. If it's a long-term launch, then what you're trying to do is build trust and credibility which I would not be doing the incentivizing for people uh, uh, posting on you. I would be focusing much more on content, content sharing sites, articles, those kinds of things. I'm building out a Facebook page that had good, solid information on it in your particular category. I'm building out videos. So in other words, you go to much of the more of the core social media strategies when you're doing a long-term launch than you do when you're doing a short launch that's only, only, going be, only going to be open for a short period of time. Here's a question from Victor. Uh, I assume he is relating this to social media. How do you reach CEOs and larger companies to have dialogues on organizational transformation and processes? I find most CEOs don't get into blogging and uh, tweeting. Am I correct on this? Okay, most CEOs are not actively tweeting. Most CEOs are just barely getting the fact that there is this thing called social media, but most CEOs use Google constantly. So the biggest strategy to get to CEOs using social media is a content strategy. I would be having blogging. I would be using putting articles up on other content sharing sites. I would be building out content wherever I could. I would be doing some video. Uh, 
because all those things are going to get in the search engines and will show up well in the search engines and do very well for you. It's great. Here's a question from Alfonso. Do you, recom do you recommend a list of past posts on my blog? I want to be able to recycle my best content, and I'm thinking to hide other content so I can increase my opt-in rate for blog updates. Okay. The last part of it I didn't understand, but the first part of about putting lists of past posts, that is absolutely an amazing strategy where uh, we call it in the business sneeze pages, where you say, here's, the, here's my top five blog posts from the month of August, or here are the five best tips on blank. And basically, each one of those is a short description, a, a line that's a link to it, and then a short description of that particular blog post. So you'll take like the five posts that you've written about subject X, and you'll put make a post about those other posts. And so that way, you're con you're building more links to them, as well as taking people who may have forgotten or never seen them and pointing them at them. Perfect, Don. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to share this social media wisdom with us. Uh, again, will you just let everyone know how to get in touch with you if they uh, would like to check out your other materials and uh, maybe see some of your other training? Okay, so the first thing I would recommend is that you jump over to socialprofitformula.com and opt in there. Uh, there's three great videos that are there. And then you can follow me on twitter.com slash Don underscore Crowther. Uh, Facebook.com, I'm Don Crowther Social, and DonCrowther.com is my blog. So SocialProfitFormula.com and then those three. Thank you, Evan, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Don. I appreciate you uh, doing this training for us.